Okay, I guess we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Sean Haig, and I'm a program coordinator from the Center for Transportation Studies. Just wanted to kick off the seminar today. The seminar is our third seminar uh, with the Advanced Transportation Seminar Series, a part of the ITS Institute. And um, for those of you that are on the web, because um, this seminar is also uh, live streaming, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them, and we'll check questions at the end, uh, the presentation, and, and certainly um, ask them uh, to our presenter uh, today. And then any of you in the room, if you do have a question, feel free to speak into the microphone um, so those of you that are watching online can hear you. And um, I think those are all the announcements for today. And I will turn it over to Jan Lucky, who also works at the Center for Transportation Studies, to give our, uh, us an introduction to our speaker today. Thanks, Sean. So my name's Jan, and I'm the Manager of Research Administration for the Center for Transportation Studies. Thanks for being here. And it's my pleasure today to introduce Professor John Evans. I've been talking with John for years via phone and email, but this is the first time we've met face-to-face, -face, so that's really exciting for me. And the title of today's seminar is Detection of Road and Bridge Surface Conditions Using Time Domain Reflectrometry and Dielectric Relaxation Spectroscopy. Or for those that are interested in the plain English version, um, Professor Evans is going to discuss a practical sensor technology to improve public safety through the remote sensing of snow and ice on bridge and road surfaces. And I've talked directly uh, with uh, engineers at MnDOT in the Duf Duluth area, Rob Eggy, as well as the St. Louis County uh, Transportation en Engineer, Victor Lund, who talk enthusiastically about what Professor Evans is doing and how supportive they are and the vision that they see towards um, the long-term implementation. And that is, um, it's always great to see research that's moving closer and closer to that. So a little bit more about Professor Evans. He did his undergrad at Washington Jefferson College in Pennsylvania, his PhD at the University of De De Delaware, and his postdoc at Ohio State before coming here and teaching chemistry at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, <laughs> and then moving to where I would love to be someday, um, beautiful northern Minnesota up at UMD. So without further ado, please welcome a Professor John Evans. Thank you very much. Well, um, today's talk is kind of a mix of all sorts of things. Even though I'm an analytical chemist by training and done lots of different <coughs> things, uh, this project sort of uh, was one that we came upon rather serendipitously uh, in discussions with <clears throat> someone, believe it or not, selling fast oscilloscopes and making me aware of this technique of time domain reflectometry. And so after thinking about it a little bit for a while, I was struggling at the time with some other approaches to try to uh, economically detect uh, road conditions, specifically ice and other unsafe conditions on bridges using other techniques, and it dawned on me that, that this could be applied, and so that sort of started the ball rolling. So it's a combination of, of mostly uh, physics and, and uh, some software development, those sorts of things, but there's a little chemistry in there as well. So um, today I'll try to give you an idea about um, the motivation for, for doing this in terms of trying to replace other systems that are um, more expensive and more localized, uh, difficult to distribute across a large bridge deck uh, and do it economically. Uh, some background about the measurement technique that we're using with regard to time domain reflectometry and how we're processing the signals uh, from relatively simple sensors. These are passive sensors. I often joke about the fact you could, uh, in fact, make them out of coat hangers, and, and you literally could if you could make them sufficiently mechanically stable to permit uh, placing them on a road surface or a road deck. So we'll talk about the design a little bit, uh, some current prototypes, and the last one uh, we're working on is about ready uh, to be deployed in the field for field testing, and we hope from there to uh, solicit the help from uh, the District 1 MnDOT people to put one on a bridge uh, deck later this fall. So the idea is to, to provide effective real-time response to differentiate different road conditions to provide uh, either <coughs> maintenance personnel or um, uh, actual uh, drivers about unsafe conditions that, that may be present on a, a bridge deck, for instance, that they're approaching. We're uh, trying to do this inexpensively, although the signal processing uh, equipment, if you will, and the, the, the acquisition systems are a little bit expensive. They're far less expensive than uh, other current technologies, and the design is to gather data remotely, ship it to a central processing location, and then either notify personnel or um, activate signage to warn motorists about unsafe conditions. 
We'd like to make it as versatile as possible so that either during construction or after uh, construction has been completed, we can do retrofitting of these kinds of, of systems and uh, like to be able to make it fairly independent and, and amenable to um, installation virtually anywhere because of this ability to download the data to a central processing location. The traditional technologies that have been used, of course, include, uh, among others, a vibrating sensor that's uh, similar to what's being used on aircraft and wind turbine blades to detect uh, icing conditions. Uh, we were working on an optical uh, approach using near IR at the time I became aware of time domain reflectometry. And um, these can be uh, either a small or large area types of, of uh, camera systems. We were trying to do fiber optics uh, to, to lower the cost. In both cases, they're rather expensive, and um, there have been some issues with regard to reliability in some of these cases. Many of you may be familiar with the RWIS sensing technology, a commercial product um, <clears throat> that has been marketed in this country by Campbell Scientific, uh, which is a little puck of instrumentation that can be installed in a, a road deck. And again, these are a, a little more expensive than, uh, than our systems, and so we're hoping to to uh, <clears throat> beat their pricing, essentially. Their uh, system is, as I said, is a, a, a bunch of instrumentation that's put in this puck, which is actually installed and potted, if you will, by using epoxy into a roadbed. Uh, there's conductivity and temperature measurement, so on and so forth, to uh, <clears throat> gather a variety of types of data from which you can infer the uh, condition of the road surface. The technology we were trying at the time before we started the TDR work was to be able to differentiate the near-infrared spectral properties of uh, water versus ice. So these are wavelengths just beyond the red end of the visible spectrum, which consist of overtones and combination bands from uh, vibrational modes and other <coughs> modes of motion in molecules. And you can see from this, this comparison that, uh, at least in principle, the spectra are quite different. But uh, the, the rub there, the difficulty was making <coughs> a fiber optic element and sensing uh, actually a sensing cell, if you will, or internal reflection element, which was uh, going to be able to withstand the pounding of traffic rolling over it. <clears throat> the early uh, systems that were employed in, in um, our uh, labs up north were uh, an infrared system, and this shows it installed on a, uh, <coughs> an overhead uh, arrangement uh, about 2000, and it proved to be very unreliable and eventually was abandoned. So we're trying to, to uh, get around that. These optical uh, systems, large area detection, uh, have some, some issues and some problems with regard to using different wavelengths of light and trying to capture essentially a photograph of the road surface and detect whether or not there is icing present. Um, and they have, of course, a limited area that they can sample. And there's also some difficulty with interpreting the data such that you could convert it to a yes or no situation. Yes, we have ice present in an unsafe condition, or no, we don't. So uh, that's another aspect. Uh, although we're using fairly sophisticated signal processing, we're able to take uh, the data and reduce it to essentially a binary response that can either activate signage, as I said, or uh, notify maintenance personnel that there's some attention needs to be given to that condition. So another example here from a so-called ice hawk system, um, which has been used on uh, aircraft uh, as they depart uh, to determine whether or not there's a need for additional application of de-icing chemicals. So it's another uh, <coughs> more or less photographic or camera-based technology. Uh, there have been also uh, developments and discussions about using reflectance near infrared, so the same wavelength region that I was trying to exploit with the fiber optic systems, uh, and either making them uh, stationary or vehicle mounted. Again, there's an issue with regard to um, the uh, expense of ha having someone drive the vehicle over the bridge to determine the conditions. Uh, in the case of the vehicle mounted one, and, you know, basically, uh, I don't think it has much promise. Um, I optical sensors, fortunately, can be uh, bought for very little money. And, and if they can be implemented using this kind of fiber optic technique, they would be um, certainly very valuable. There are different kinds of elements that can be included on integrated chip types of, of devices or support platforms. And if these could be ruggedized, certainly I think there still remains some promise there. 
And the idea being that you want to have some kind of distributed system. So imagine that this is one lane of a bridge deck, and you want to be able to um, have various sensing stations, whether they're optical or, as in our case, using TDR technology, and be able to have them be sampled and <coughs> have a um, local processing system send the information back to a central processing uh, system if necessary, and then by reaching a conclusion from mathematical um, application of mathematical and statistical data processing, possibly alert signage. So we still have this general approach in mind, but we're going to use different technology. And the technology we are using is time domain reflectometry. And in fact, we're using a dielectric relaxation spectroscopy uh, application of time domain reflectometry. So there's a lot, of, a lot of words there. I'll try to make it as simple as possible so that uh, we don't get bogged down in the details of the technology. Historically, uh, this is a pretty well-developed technology and used primarily, uh, initially, in moisture content determinations in soil, uh, primarily in agronomy applications, but also in soil science and hydrology. And uh, <coughs> recently, there are deployment of these systems in agricultural installations so that there can be optimization of the application of water uh, in, under arid conditions so that you don't overdo the watering or water unnecessarily by continually using this kind of, of remote system with a sensor which looks like a big pitchfork basically that's stuck in the ground and you launch a pulse down that and through the reflected pulse you can ascertain uh, the approximate water content in the soil. Uh, more recently, and in fact the way I learned about time domain reflectometry was its application in technology involving the transmission of digital signals, whether it's over a long distance or the short distance of a um, circuit board, interconnects between high speed storage devices, these kinds of things. It's a way of looking for faults in transmission lines. And <clears throat> of course those are things you don't want present because when we have unwanted reflections during a digital transmission it can cause a great number of errors to accumulate. So uh, the kind of data that one uh, acquires in the soil science application is you send a pulse down through the, the uh, metal detector system and the reflection uh, comes back delayed, if you will, depending upon the dielectric properties of the soil in contact with the metal um, rods in the probe. And so depending upon <coughs> the amount of water in the soil, the time delay, if you will, before reflection is, uh, is changed, and one can fit this time delay uh, to uh, calibration data to determine the, roughly the percentage of water that's pre present. It's a fairly fast uh, time frame for the acquisition. Fortunately, there's uh, relatively inexpensive electronics available from Campbell Scientific who market these kinds of systems. And so we didn't have to work the electronics from the ground up. We could buy their uh, commercially developed systems. And of course, the, the more exotic uh, application is to look at transmission lines on circuit boards and interconnects, as I described. That requires even faster um, electronics, <coughs> which fortunately we haven't had to go to, and that's saved costs considerably. So the idea in general is that we're really evaluating it, the properties of a transmission line. And for those of you with a little EE background, we can uh, simulate a transmission line like a, a coaxial cable that we might think about in our uh, home uh, cable TV system is one where we have a source which sees essentially a constant loading uh, associated with the transmission line. And so as we transmit data down that transmission line to the load, it's delivered efficiently and without reflection. And so if you've often wondered, well, how can a 50 ohm cable have a 50 ohm impedance, whether it's a foot long or 500 feet long, it's because of the nature of the uh, <coughs> way the electronic response of this device works. Uh, basically, some very simple relationships between the velocity of propagation and uh, the so-called static dielectric constant, or the square root of the static dielectric constant, of the uh, material that is separating the conductors and the cable. <coughs> The kind of reflection we'd expect from a well-matched termination on a transmission line. So we launch a pulse, let's say, down one end. It goes through a transmission line and arrives at this destination. is a sharp reflection. And uh, <clears throat> that is the ideal situation if along the way there is some 
a sort of uh, imperfection uh, caused by a break or, let's say, water that's accumulated in the line, then there's going to be a premature uh, reflection back down that line. And that is how one can do fault detection or find out where the fault lies. Well, our interest has been to push it a little bit further and to not just rely on reflection timing, but to uh, rely on the nature of the medium in contact with the metal in such systems to give us information about whether we're dealing with water or ice or uh, air in the absence of any kind of precipitation or electrolyte that might be present after application of de-icing chemicals. So the dielectric constant, as it's referred to, is really not a constant. It's a, um, it's a, uh, imaginary, a real and imaginary combination, uh, a complex number, which is a function of frequency. And from the point of view of its ability to detect different molecules and different states for those molecules, we can think of it in terms of the kinds of molecular uh, motions that might take place in response to an applied electric field. So the simplest thing would be uh, a response to a, a, a rotational mode in a molecule like water, uh, or comparing water to ice, uh, stretching and so on. If we could go fast enough, we could even see electronic uh, excitation of molecules in contact with these uh, conductors. So it's almost like doing a kind of spectroscopy on a wire. And in our case, um, we're interested in the fact that the dielectric properties of um, materials are going to vary depending upon their temperature and their state, whether it's liquid or solid, what have you. And uh, it's the, essentially the dielectric relaxation spectra and the properties that we're interested in trying to capture and process. We're not interested in the specifics of the motion and interpreting all the details of these spectra. Rather, we want to take the information content that's presented in the waveform which is reflected from our sensor, which terminates a transmission line, standardize that or, uh, against uh, values that we, we know or conditions we know, and then come back and while it's operative, we can match those reflections and those responses to standardized responses for the for the particular sensor. So the electronics are pretty straightforward. We have uh, essentially a, a step generator that launches a very fast rise time pulse down a transmission line to our sensor, which is located at the end, uh, similar to the resistor I showed you in an earlier slide. And then that, that's the load in the, the case of this very uh, um, <laughs> straightforward schematic. And that reflected pulse comes back and is sampled by a very fast analog digital converter. And so in our case, for one of our early prototype sensors, you can see here, I apologize, the colors aren't coming out very well. But here's a response for one of our sensors for air in black. Ice is in red, and you can see particularly these wiggles um, are out of phase a little bit with the, the uh, air situation. Water is quite a bit different. And so we want to take all the information content that we can that's present there and without understanding the source and why all the little wiggles are there, simply use it as a template or an ID for the material that we have in contact with our sensor. So the approach is basically going to be to standardize a particular sensor design with responses from water or ice, so on and so forth, in the laboratory, have a library of standards, and then come back and when we deploy the sensor or, or challenge it with a new um, condition, be it water or ice or electrolyte, what have you, uh, to be able to determine ultimately a very simple response. Is it safe or unsafe? And we do that by along the way deciding if we're dealing with water or ice or air, um, snow, frost, etc., in contact with the conductors of our sensors. So this is some very early data we got uh, just to sort of test the, the hypothesis that we could get distinguishable responses from different uh, kinds of, of conditions. And you can see ice and air are the most challenging two to resolve from one another. We, it's pretty easy, though, even though they're very similar and very different from other conditions we might encounter in terms of what's on the road or bridge surface. Um, we can look at them and make a decision very easily. So the challenge becomes how do we process them to come up with essentially a binary output, yes, we're safe, or no, we're not. And that's part of the, uh, of the challenge that we've, we've dealt with. So from a variety of different approaches, we've um, developed this particular system 
to, to deal with it. We take our raw signal, uh, at, whether it's a standard or data coming in from, from a, a sensor that's already been standardized. We differentiate it to accentuate the wiggles, if you will, smooth it to get rid of some noise that's uh, introduced because of the differentiation process. We then do a straight out correlation between the derivative and the stored set of standard derivatives for that particular sensor. We take it and apply a wavelet filter, which is essentially allows us to differentiate high frequency and low frequency uh, content in those waveforms, and then compare the wavelet filtered standards to the one we're getting under test conditions. And from each of these, we get essentially a correlation coefficient. We sum those up to get what we call a figure of merit, which at, at maximum, under perfect match conditions, would give us three, one from each of these correlations. So the challenge then becomes to design a, a system which will uh, allow us to get that kind of ready differentiation. Just a, a, a comment about wavelet filtering. You might say, well, why don't you use Fourier transforms? It's, it's a common technique to, to process data and to get frequency content. Uh, wavelet filtering tends to be a little more uh, applicable and appropriate for these kinds of situations and this type of, of signal information. Um, so it's, it's similar to Fourier transforms, except a different kind of function is used. You choose a wavelet uh, function to use, and, and you retain better um, <clears throat> resolution across the frequency spectrum. Well, we tried all sorts of different designs, and this is kind of a smorgasbord of of different ones consisting of metal plates with magnet wire wrapped around them, circular incarnations, conical ones, uh, flat pieces of conductor with uh, <clears throat> dielectric between them, um, a mesh with a piece of magnet wire over top of it, all sorts of different things to allow us to, to just sort of fly by the seat of our pants without having to get down and do a lot of simulations of the uh, response. and. Uh, we found lots that really work very, very well. The challenge then become, can we put it in some sort of planar configuration so that it could actually be deployed on a road surface or a bridge deck and also withstand the possibility of traffic and snow plows and so on running over top of it? And that became fairly challenging. Um, early sensing systems such as this one that involved a set of parallel aluminum rods, half-inch rods that are affixed to a piece of polypropylene uh, so, as I said, coat hangers are really not that far away from this. It's, it's uh, very, very cheap to, to make. And you can see the, the response that we get with what we call a so-called simulated weather cycle, where we uh, add water to the system at this point, and you can see we go from a, a detection of air to a, a detection of water based on that figure of merit. So there's quite a bit of, of distinction or difference between uh, the values that we obtain as we compare the incoming response to this bank of standards which we've stored from previous experiments. We then um, turn on a, a cooling system that we have in the laboratory and things cool down, it freezes, so we now get a nice response in place of the water. We turn off the cooling, allow it to warm up, and finally um, to evaporate. And so you can sort of see how we would be able to, to tap these responses and if required, to say, all right, we have this particular condition on this sensor at this point in time. And from that, we can decide, well, which of these categories do we consider safe or not? Uh, do we want to just alert signage that is a blinking, flashing light, or do we want more detailed that the surface is wet but is not uh, frozen? So all those things are possible with this technology. And so back to this idea about deploying a number of these relatively low-cost sensors on a deck. We basically would you know, use a, uh, a boring uh, system to, to, to cut into the concrete, similar to the way the Arwis devices were installed uh, previously, uh, drop in the, uh, the, de the device sensing package, if you will, which is going to be one of our sensors along with a thermistor to measure um, the temperature and run the cabling for each one of those then back to a common processing station which has uh, a data logger and the TDR electronics to, to send pulses to each one of these through a multiplex system. And then that can communicate back to the central processing facility where we can crunch the numbers, do the processing, including the wavelet analysis that would be impractical to 
uh, do at the remote location. And also our central processing facility can handle a large number of these. So once a decision is made, as I said before, we could uh, send information back from the central processing system to alert the motorists with local signage. We could also then uh, send that same information to the maintenance shed or to um, uh, remotely to, to uh, truck drivers who are driving these salting and plowing rigs that we have a particular problem at a certain location. Our current ruggedized version of this sensor is this puck, which is about uh, five inches in diameter. It's uh, machined from aluminum, aircraft quality aluminum. Uh, the center white portions here are uh, polypropylene, and there's a stainless steel electrode that's kind of a bar cross section there and there, and there's a silicone dielectric between it. So we compress the silicone uh, so we can seal out water and what have you from getting in between the electrodes. And then it's just the top edges and uh, whatever is in between those two that's going to give rise to the response as we send that uh, sharp rise time pulse down to one end and it's reflected back and then our electric, uh, electronics collect it, send it for analysis. So we're pretty confident that something like this with a, about a half inch thickness of aluminum can be placed in the roadbed or in the bridge deck, potted with epoxy along with the channels that lead the cabling back to the, the uh, local electronics package. Um, one thing that we're still continuing to work on is the optimization of the window over which we make those kinds of comparisons, whether it's the straight derivative or the high or the low frequency content. Um, what we're plotting here on, on the z-axis is that figure of merit. So you can see it runs from three down to um, zero. And this basically allows us to look at the starting point and the width of the interval over which we're going to make the comparison to the standards. And as you can see, there's an optimum right in here where uh, we've got very, very good uh, differentiation between the two most challenging waveforms, that that comes from uh, air in contact with a sensor versus that for ice. So there's still some, some tweaking and, and uh, finer points we're developing, um, but we're pretty comfortable that it's, it's getting to the reliable stage and we can deploy it. Uh, the remote electronics that I've alluded to are commercial electronics uh, coming from Campbell uh, Scientific. They're the same kind of stations that they would employ in an agricultural setting. Uh, involves a, a local uh, <coughs> data logger uh, the time domain reflectometry uh, pulse generator uh, multiplexer to allow us to send that signal to up to a total of 64 uh, different passive sensors in this kind of a system. And in this case, this shows a, um, a wireless modem as the mechanism for communication. So along with solar panels to power this, it could be deployed in a remote location where power is not available locally. So through this cell phone modem communication, we've tested it um, between Cloquet and our lab in Duluth, and no problems with regard to getting enough data quickly enough to, to uh, have it work. As I said, the next step is to actually take this sensor and stick it in the pavement down there at our testing facility in Cloquet. There's a lane which used to be a um, way station, which the MnDOT people have allowed us to use for testing. And the, the, the plows come through and they plow it just as if it were um, part of the roadway and they salt it and so on and so forth. So it'll give us a, a good test bed for starters. And with a little bit of success, we'll then go on to deploying a second system uh, involving this kind of a package powered with solar panels uh, on a District 1 bridge in the not too distant future. So um, the individuals who've worked on this, uh, starting with Brian Fenstrom, who was a master's student, uh, he looked preliminarily at this approach versus using some other kinds of, of uh, <coughs> impedance measuring electrochemical approaches. Um, Evan Anderson, Lucas Busta, and Robert Stickle have succeeded him and done most of the development. Robert's the, the newest kid on the block. Lucas is now off doing graduate work at the University of British Columbia, and Evan's a senior. Uh, we've been very blessed and fortunate to have some very, very talented and uh, <coughs> dedicated undergraduates who can adapt from you know, the traditional type of chemistry uh, experiment or the typical kind of laboratory project they might 
be confronted with, adapt to this, learn the software, and develop the software, and also de deal with the mechanics. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Nastral is a, a, our local branch of, uh, of the, the ITS activity, uh, CTS activity, and um, we're fortunate to have support from them, which is funded by MnDOT and the Federal Department of Transportation, as well as some local funding at the University of Minnesota Duluth. So uh, many thanks to all of those people for uh, providing the, the resources and the talent to do the job. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, John. Does anybody have any questions in the room here? A little faster than I thought. Do we have any questions online? Oh, we got one from Raj. Um, so the time delay, uh, you said, is, is small of the order of nanoseconds. Um, yes. If, if you have a long wiring, um, you know, from various sensors on, on the deck to a central location, does that introduce a lot of noise? Uh, does it make it more difficult to well, uh, what find we can, the time delay? What we're able to do is simply delay the time window over which we take the data. So we don't start acquiring the reflected pulse until it's already gotten to the sensor and come back. So we account for that ideal transmission line behavior and that's part of the calibration, both with regard to delay and any loss in uh, high frequency content that is due to the fact that it's an imperfect transmission line. So it doesn't really affect um, the measurement, the, 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 the cable length. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, one back here. If you could hold the microphone a little closer. Um, how do the sensors react to contaminants like gravel and dust on ah, the roadway? Good question. Excellent question. And in fact, I, I should have stopped to, to make that point back here when I was showing this response. It's probably a little difficult to see. But actually, we were testing this by throwing uh, some, some sand that we acquired basically in the parking lot. Uh, at UMD. We threw that on top of the sensor and then sent it through this cycle. So uh, that's an important design criterion. And that's a very good question. So now we've gotten to the point where even rather than having this uh, kind of space between the rods which, where that kind of stuff could accumulate, uh, we've gotten rid of that with a totally planar des uh, design. Still there could be stuff on top of it. And uh, the fortunate part about that is that uh, sand and dirt have a pretty low dielectric constant. If we don't have a lot of it in very intimate contact with the metal, it shouldn't be a problem. We'll see. Um, the, uh, the sensitivity, or we're most sensitive to things that are actually in direct contact, physical contact with the electrode surfaces over the distance of a few microns is the highest sensitivity, and then it drops off with, with uh, distance. So even a lot of sand that only has certain point contacts, if you will, with the surface of the electrodes should not be a problem. We'll see in practice. Hopefully it won't be. Now, you know, gum wrapper or something like that, that you know, aluminum foil that ends up on top of it, that's a different, a different issue. And that's, again, a good reason why <coughs> you want to have multiple sensors at a given location so you have some redundancy in case of that kind of uh, situation. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. Well, I guess we'll wrap up the seminar. Thanks a lot again, John, for Thank the presentation. You. Appreciate and, uh, your attention. Our next seminar is in two weeks, and I believe it's also another Duluth professor, Imran Hayi, and I actually don't have the topic with me, but it'll be in two weeks in this room um, at 3.30. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you.